I don't know what, what the future holds, but what, what are your favorite memories about this place? Our kids jumping in bed with us. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. Just a catch of strays over here. <laughs> You're in for a hell of a show. Keep the faith. Hold the line and own the lid. It's time for our main. <laughs> oh, welcome back to the Ruthless Variety Program. I don't know what we just watched, fellas. I th that's absolutely incredible. <laughs> Joe Biden. His kids, his kids are in their 50s. What the, what the fuck is he talking about? So he was being asked for, for the folks who are on YouTube of, by Al Roker, I believe, yeah, right? Absolutely. Of, of like, a, hey, you know, what's your – if I don't know how things are going to go, meaning whether you get reelected or not. What's your favorite memories you've had so far here at the White House? Yeah. And Biden's like, kids jumping in yeah. the <laughs> – It's What I love about it is it's like it's Easter – it's the egg roll at the White House. Al Roker is asking you a question. Could it possibly get any easier to not mess up? No, not possible. <laughs> he's like, so at this point, the dementia is so bad, he's like seeing through time. <laughs> like, he doesn't know where he is. He doesn't know when he oh. is. Wait, how do, you know, how do you know Hunter's not jumping on the bed with That's him and Jill? Thing. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe he gave up the ghost. Yeah. The, 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 the only way that Hunter Biden is jumping in bed with... Pop Pop is if it, they're trying to get him to sign some invoice for Burisma. Pretty much. <laughs> uh, anyway, well, you know, welcome back. A good Thursday episode of the Ruthless Variety program. We're out. Uh, one one of the hosts here today. No no Holmes. No Holmes. We miss him. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll do my my best to to lead the show in his place. I'm Michael Duncan here with me, comfortably smug, and John Ashbrook, fellas. Uh, We've got a great story here, um, the first one that, that we have to put up top because Lee loves the meat, obviously, mm -hmm. at the top of the show. Mm -hmm. And it's a, a fav favorite hobby horse of, of, of us here at the Variety Program, and that is the media. Mm. Uh, this is a story out of Detroit, the Detroit News. Um, and uh, the headline here is, uh, Pouncing and Seizing Outrage. Mm -hmm. Michigan Republicans look to capitalize on migrant crime. Uh, so, <laughs> it's a ridiculous framing. Yeah, so um, the uh, op opinion piece here in the Detroit News, I'll just read from it. Um, I know uh, the known facts surrounding the horrific slaying of Ruby Garcia read like a campaign and Republican political consultants have been waiting to produce. A 25-year-old Mexican national who entered the U.S. illegally not once but twice has been charged in the death of his girlfriend, a 25-year-old Grand Rapids woman. Some Republicans and political strategists are already planning to hang the circumstances of Garcia's death on Biden, fellow Democrats in Congress, and existing border policy and security procedures amid a surge in illegal crossings. This is, to me, like the crux of the crisis and problem that we're facing in this country today, where one side is so very committed to this insane progressive movement that they are willing to try to not only themselves, not like don't believe your lying eyes, but bully others on their side into being like, listen, it, the, the problem here isn't that like a woman was murdered or that this is one of now many cases where an illegal alien has murdered somebody or there's all this crime being committed by illegal aliens. The issue here is... Republicans are going to point out this fact. Right. Like, th the death of somebody doesn't matter to this guy. Yeah. He's worried that because Joe Biden and took away all the executive orders that protected the border and that Democrats in the Senate refused to take up H.R. 2, which Republicans in the House passed to secure the border, he knows it's all on him. Yeah, the, the voters the, know it's all on Biden. The, the problem isn't that the crime is happening and the murder is happening and the illegal invasion of our country is happening it's that we're noticing that's the problem that might be a problem right and if you wonder how eight and a half million people have come into this country illegally since joe biden was sworn in and millions and millions more have come in since our border has been open for the last 25 years if you wonder how that happens look no further than the media but not the entire media there are other there are some in the media who oh are, here he goes who are out there here reporting goes, the facts sure nobody's Bill Malugin, for example. Yeah. Well, yes. well, that's true. Yeah. Bill okay, Malugin yeah. Rock solid. tweeted earlier today that 
Uh, 182 Chinese nationals were apprehended by the Border Patrol after crossing illegally in San Diego yesterday. There have been more than 22,000 Chinese nationals caught by Border Patrol since last October. And a reminder from Malugin that apprehended doesn't mean deported. Yep. So people come into this country illegally. They're apprehended and then they're released. So we have a problem with the border. It's one of our top issues in this election. It's one of the biggest problems we have in this country, and the media doesn't even care. Americans for Prosperity has done it again. You're going to love this. Know how Biden's been running around the country bragging about Bidenomics, and the media's doing stories on how the president has embraced the term? Well, guess what? Americans for Prosperity just bought the Bidenomics.com domain name. I can't believe the White House didn't get this first. This would be like Pepsi buying Coca-Cola.com. It's hilarious. Bidenomics.com sets the record straight on the failures of Joe Biden's economy, his horrible record on cost of living, wages, debt, deficits, energy, and more. I've been to the site. I can tell you, it's not what Joe Biden wants Americans to see. AFP takes Biden's own words and compares them to the reality of everyday Americans. It's packed with facts and stories that prove Bidenomics is a costly failure. Americans for Prosperity deserves a lot, a lot of credit for this coup. Visit Bidenomics.com soon, the website Joe Biden doesn't want you to see. Well, what's really interesting from this article, again, it's just it's crazy that the frame is Republicans pounce because it isn't even just this one horrific story of this woman being murdered. It also says here, in the exact same piece, the Garcia slaying is the second recent homicide in Grand Rapids involving an immigrant in the past year. Last month, a Kent County jury convicted 27-year-old Mexican national Luis Fabian Bernal Sosa in the murder of his mother, uh, of the mother of his young child. Yeah. So it's a clearly an it's obvious an problem. Issue. <laughs> and 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 that they want to try and tell voters because that's what this is aimed at when you see this in a publication right and he's and, and his frame as republicans pounce it's a straight-up political piece to just say to voters hey here's the thing don't believe your lying eyes it's okay if you get murdered as long as we get you know glorious leader joe biden elected again that's all that matters it doesn't matter how many americans have to be killed robbed assaulted doesn't matter at all all they need is for joe biden to get back there yeah it's, it's interesting um because whenever the left can promote some absolute terrible tragedy uh, to try to help the Democratic Party, it's always a discussion of the current policy, right? Like mm -hmm. it's like, you know, let's say there's some horrific school shooting or some hate crime that's laid at the feet of Republican politicians, right? It's your rhetoric caused this. It's the gun policy in this country caused this. But when it comes to illegal immigrants murdering American citizens, suddenly policy isn't a discussion. Nope. What Joe Biden right. did isn't a discussion. Nope. The border is not a discussion. It's what Republicans that's might exactly do right. on the issue itself. Right, that's exactly right. It's a problem. We're not allowed to talk about it unless it's framed under what the mainstream media wants it to be framed under, which is basically non-existent. Uh, uh, well, it's just a horrific story, and the media sucks, and I hate it so much. But we got a lot here coming up on Ruthless. We're going to have a Hack Madness update. That's uh, right. A lot going on there. Uh, a, a surprising bracket. It I think there's really been a lot, a lot of movement. I would say, you know, tip of the cap to myself. I feel like I kind of predicted this. Mm -hmm. um, we also have a polling election update. Very interesting stuff there. Um, we're going to have a segment here on the national debt, um, which is a, a topic that doesn't get nearly the coverage it should. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we're going to try to make it interesting. Um, and then, I mean, the variety in today's episode, there's some Mike Tyson stuff. Yeah. There's a lot of good variety. So we're going to get to all of that after this. The media is great at distracting you from things you should actually be focused on. While the media was debating Taylor Swift, China, Russia, Brazil, India, and South Africa, basically half the world's population created BRICS. That's B-R-I-C-S, which is a massive economic alliance that's already talking about replacing the dollar with their own currency. The consequences of this could be dire, with your 401k accounts losing value if BRICS is successful. Why risk your personal savings? 
diversify your financial future, invest in the one thing that has proven stable for centuries, gold from today's sponsor, Allegiance Gold. They've earned the highest trust ratings in the precious metals industry, and their relationships are based on integrity, expertise, and impeccable service. Go to protectwithruthless.com today or call 855-510-GOLD. Right now, get up to 5000 in free silver with a qualifying purchase. Don't rely on promises of ever-increasing stock values or assurances the economy will remain stable forever. Protect your financial future today. Protectwithruthless.com. That's protectwithruthless.com or call 855-510-GOLD. All right, we got to get to these polls. Um, you know, there were some recent polls put out by the Wall Street Journal. Uh, there's Harvard Harris polls and all those sorts of things. But to sort of frame up this discussion, I think we have to play that great clip that we have of Dr. Dr. Jill oh. Biden. Let's play that. When these polls like the Wall Street Journal one land in the White House and he's losing in all the battleground states. Then... No, he's not losing in all the battleground oh, states. He's coming up and he's um, a even or doing better. So, mm. you know what? Once people start to focus in and they see their two choices, mm -hmm. it's obvious that Joe will win this election. All right. <laughs> Did you, I, so that's another reason to, to watch on YouTube is the reaction on his face yeah. when Dr. Jill Biden, MD, DDS, is like, no, <laughs> he's not losing. He's not down in any of the polls. He's, he, he's getting back up. He's catching up. But like, if you're saying he's like catching up, that means he's behind. Yeah. He's losing in all the battleground states. Yeah, it's a real Baghdad Bob routine yeah. that she's sort of pulling off there. I think um, yeah, the Wall Street Journal yeah. had a poll out just recently that disputes what Dr. Exactly. Joe Biden is saying. Yeah, Spaghetti, let's put up that graphic number one. Yeah, so this is that Wall Street Journal poll in all of the swing states here, Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin— Trump has a lead in all of those states and a tie in Wisconsin currently. Mm -hmm. um, if he if these were to hold through Election Day, it would be a route. You know, I mean, you'd pick up Pennsylvania and Michigan, you know, the two in the sort of blue wall that Democrats right. always talk about. That is their their way of, of, of winning the Electoral College. And if you won Nevada, too, I mean, that's just icing on the cake. Right. And what this poll says more than anything is that voters are dissatisfied with the work that Joe Biden has done for the last three and a half years. It says it loud and clear. If you look at his approval ratings, they're below 40, the lowest of any president going into reelection. Remember, Obama's approval ratings were hovering right around 40 and they improved. But what Obama had in the 2012 election that Joe Biden doesn't have is the ability to sell something. Joe Biden has no ability to talk to Al Roker, much less the American people. Right. And so these numbers are a reflection of Joe Biden's inability to solve the border crisis, Joe Biden's inability to bring grocery prices down, Joe Biden's inability to stop crime that's out of control in these cities. Yeah. I, what I'm curious, guys, because <clears throat> I've seen a lot of RFK stuff here in the news in the last week um the way he's trying to triangulate you know on a lot of these issues between trump and biden i i, I saw a clip about how you you know he said you can make an argument that joe biden's a, a bigger threat to democracy mm -hmm. than donald trump because mm -hmm. of the censorship regime that has flourished under joe biden especially when it relates to things like social media and things like that and i'm curious what your guys's thoughts are on you know if, if rfk is in all these swing states, how that impacts ultimately the ballot number. Because here, what I see here in all of these polls, and this is something to be concerned about, you know, whether you're Donald Trump or Joe Biden is, you know, nobody's a 50 percent. Right. You know, I think I think you make a great point, because what we're talking about with this Wall Street Journal poll is a head to head matchup. When you put RFK into the poll, you see numbers coming off of Biden's side in huge quantities, because there are a number of voters on the Dem side who are to the left of Biden, who aren't satisfied for whatever reason, yeah. because Biden isn't doing enough for Hamas or Biden isn't doing enough for, for whatever their special interest might be, and they want something different. And RFK is bad news for Joe Biden, 
And I think you make a great point. So for me, I, I think that's a little bit of like a, a mirage, kind of like a smoke screen, because I think it goes back to the Oh, you don't whole, think RFK is going to pull off a of Biden? I don't know if, if, if he's going to do it in substantial manner. I think, you know, uh, I, I mean, it'd be great if he did, but I, I get the feeling when you mentioned because I think you're 100% right that it's like the disaffected Dems, the ones who are like, Biden hasn't gone far enough yeah. that are with RFK as kind of like a protest. But it's again, like when it actually comes down to voting, like you, you'll you have the incumbents party belly aching and being like, oh, you know, we're not happy. The, the grassroots being like, we're not happy with this guy. But when it comes to actually voting, it's not like they're going to vote for the other guy or, or, or end up not voting. Yeah, you, you do have to wonder there if RFK's number is sort of similar to that uncommitted number that yep. you see in these Democratic primaries around the country, or if it is actually a hard, you know, I want to elect RFK number. Because it can happen. Like, at the Ross Perot, the percentage that he took off of H.W. Bush got Bill Clinton elected. Bill Clinton yeah. didn't crack 50%. <clears throat> um, so there can be a third-party spoiler. It takes a lot. A lot of money. A lot of money. A lot of organization. To, to, to make that happen. Um, also, seeing these polls, I always... You know, they're, they are starting to tighten. And, you know, I always caution people from overconfidence or thinking, you know, our side can let up or anything like that, because the Democrats are going to unleash a tidal wave of money, the likes of which we have never seen before in our lives. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's going to be like, I would not be surprised if they spend double in this election what they did last time, because, you know, having Trump on the ballot lets a lot of these Democrat billionaires and and uh, you know left wing dark money groups kind of use it as an opportunity to be like oh we are virtuous because we're fighting Trump so like yeah. if you're a billionaire and you know you give ten mil to Joe Biden's super PAC you're gonna get all these invites to all the parties in the Hamptons yeah it's it's part of your DEI budget at this point yeah they're <laughs> like all, all of a sudden you know all your like billionaire buddies are gonna think you're super cool um, the same way that like Sam Bankman Freed kind of exposed how democrat politics works in that way it's it's like cash and carry yeah like government they they will if you give them money they'll give you carte blanche they'll treat you like a friend they roll out the red carpet and i think we're gonna see so much so much of of these billionaires just unloading cash and it's gonna be an issue so I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned that smug because there's two other parts of this segment i want to get to here because we you know we we gave you the the good news, but there is uh, some things to be concerned about as well. If you're if you're Donald Trump in this, um, Spaghetti, can we put up graphic number two? Uh, and this is the Harvard Harris poll, and um, there was a story also in the Hill. Um, basically, Trump has maintained his lead over Joe Biden in the Harvard Harris poll, but it has closed. Uh, Trump dropped uh, a six point lead down to a two point lead. The earlier poll being from February, and this one more recent, obviously. Um, you know, so these things are going to bounce around, and everybody's mm -hmm. got a different sample. They have a different methodology for these polls. You're going to see stuff that makes you feel good. There's going to st be stuff that makes you feel worried. But I think, as we've always said, you know, here on the show, is the polls are going to bounce around, but the strategy and the tact tactics is ultimately what decides whether we win. Well, this is why I think um, it is so important uh, that Trump hired professionals to run his <clears throat> campaign uh, for the 2024 cycle. Susie Wiles, Chris Lasavito are running a ship that is basically indistinguishable from a campaign that op would operate under any circumstances, under any Republican nominee for president. He has a team that is extremely professional, and he has a team that has now taken over the RNC and in the month of March has raised, what, $65 million at the RNC. They are, they are taking, they're playing like, uh, like they're losing. You know, they, they're not taking anything for granted. They're not looking at the Wall Street Journal numbers mm -hmm. and thinking, you know what, we're winning. We're going to sleep our way to election day every single day. They have they're doing their calls. They're making sure that their their field team is turning in numbers and turning in results because they know that if they don't do that, they're not going to win. And I think that's part of the genius of hiring such a professional organization. So uh, I, I get that all on the organization side, and I totally 100 percent agree. 
I think the other component of this, and, and we haven't talked about this in a while, it's probably been six months since we have, but there is a, a, a cash problem. There's a cash problem in Republican politics right now. We alluded to it uh, on the Tuesday episode with the small dollar problem the Republican Party has had. But if you look at um, you know the, the Trump versus Biden on the fundraising side, DNC versus RNC uh, at the committee level, uh, this from the Daily Caller, um, you know, 65 uh, million in March. Um, right. That's know, a for, good it's a good number. It's a it's a it's a good number. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but Biden in the DNC uh, just topped 25 million in one fundraiser in New York City. On That's Thursday, what I'm talking about. Like, uh, with with Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. And the Democrats ended February with a combined 97.5 million on hand, mm -hmm. far outpacing Trump in the RNC. Um and obviously, Donald Trump has all these legal cases, too. And a lot of uh, you know costs are going to come out at, of at paying those lawyers and fighting those cases and that sort of thing. You know, how do you close that gap on the fundraising side? That's literally the million dollar question. Right. Million dollar it's question, a, honestly. It's a, it looks like it's about a $50 million question. Well, I mean, <laughs> when it's all said and done, like over a billion is going to be spent. Right. Over a billion has been spent by both sides in previous elections. This is, I think, going to set another record, but I think by a significant margin. That example of the Democrats being able to raise $25 million in one fundraiser in one night in New York City, I think shows uh, their strength. It's this billionaire class. It's it's what, you know, the indictment has always been that the beating heart of the progressive movement is not like in unions. It's not a working class party by any measure anymore. It is the party of New York, San Francisco, professors that, that have been pushing these kind of broken brain ideas like DEI. Mm -hmm. And it's trickled up to, to the highest echelons of the party, which is bankrolled by these billionaires. Who None of these folks in New York City mm -hmm. will ever get mugged or punched in the face mm -hmm. like Every other, like a regular New Yorker is going through worried, especially women. There's been just rashes of women just getting punched in the face, beaten, attacked, people getting thrown in front of trains. None of these billionaires at this fundraiser will ever see that. So they don't give a damn. Well, and we're, we're just talking about a fundraiser for hard dollars. And but what we mean by that is is campaign dollars into the political campaign in this in the committee, the, D, the DNC. That barely scratches the surface of the far left wing dark money universe that yeah. sits sits on top of democratic mm. politics. These five hundred one c fours that orchestrate everything from voter drives to installing left wing prosecutors across the country that that caused that rise in crime. Yeah, I would like it's it's good that at this point most folks are familiar with the like uh, Soros prosecutors across this country that his left wing dark money group essentially elected because <clears throat> they said. They figured it's cheaper to buy one prosecutor than to try to elect a ton of people to Congress or whatever. Yeah, to, to change get, laws. To change why laws. Ch right. Why change laws right. when you can elect one person to ignore them? Yeah, right. that's and, an and, incredible thing. And, and you mentioned Soros, but as we all know, he is not the only Democrat mega donor. Hans Borg Weiss, yeah. obviously a foreigner. Democrats have other foreign sources of money. They this have, guy lives they in have Switzerland. He's not even an, in, in the U.S., not a U.S. citizen. I was always told that foreign interference in elections is like a bad thing. They happily take his money. They will never be called on it by the press, and we know that. And what you pointed out about Democrats having billions at their fingertips is a huge threat to our side. And I feel like the $65 million that the RNC raised in March is a good number. It's a good start. But we need to raise so much more if we're going to remain competitive headed into November. 100%. Yeah, so that's the bad news. Uh, and we're going to follow it on here with another segment of some even worse news. And that is our national debt mm. as it continues to spiral and nobody notices. Uh, this is from Yahoo Finance. Uh, the title is Debt Danger Ahead. The Congressional Budget Office warned in its latest projections that U.S. federal government debt is on path from 97 percent of GDP last year to 116 by 2034, higher even than during World <coughs> War II. The actual outlook, outlook is likely worse. From tax revenue to defense spending and interest rates, the CBO forecast released earlier this year are underpinned by rosy assumptions. Plug in the market's current view on interest rates and the debt-to-GDP ratio rises to 123 percent 
in 2034. Scary stuff. Yeah, and you know, there's also this uh, interesting article in the Wall Street Journal when when they talked about the CBO was using tax calculations as a part of that, where uh, everyone remembers Joe Biden saying he was going to build this army at the IRS to go after billionaires. Right. And we all knew that that doesn't make sense because here's the thing: it's like billionaires have an army of tax lawyers. Mm -hmm. The IRS knows it, so like. You know, sending uh, an army of what, tax accountants to try to fight billionaires lords, that doesn't work. And those billionaires are Joe Biden supporters. Right. We knew he's not going after them. What we have right. seen so far in the years that Joe Biden's been president is that over 60 percent of audits are being done to working class. That's people. right. That was in The Wall Street Journal just yesterday yep. morning. And that was not like made up by the Wall Street Journal. That is the IRS itself. watchdog who reported <laughs> itself that. Itself is reporting yeah. these it's numbers. Data. People like, under 400,000 are being audited. Yeah, not be people getting Venmo, was, Venmo well, transactions. Well, they, they said the top was yeah. 200K. We're talking about the vast majority is happening under that to working class people, which right. is what we warned everyone was what this administration was going to do, is they're going to try to like squeeze blood from a stone where the American people are already suffering mm -hmm. uh, under inflation because of Joe Biden's policies. Now we're seeing that his out-of-control spending is beyond bankrupting the U.S., accelerating the rate our country is building up national debt, where, mm -hmm. uh, like Duncan said, by 2034, we're going to be 116 percent of GDP is, yeah. is yeah, dead. Yeah, they're, they're not doing anything about inflation. They want grocery prices to go up. They want the IRS to go after middle class people. They hate the middle class. To put this they in perspective, folks, this would be like if you had uh, an annual salary of $50,000 and you had a credit card debt of $60,000. You wouldn't be feeling good. Yeah. And you've talked about credit card debt for a couple of years. You've been ringing, ringing the alarm bells here for quite some time. This is a problem that's building in our economy, and we're going to feel it. That's, that, that is another issue. So uh, we have yet again set another record for the amount of credit card debt being held by Americans. Uh, a significant portion of that in, in polls, uh, people have said that they are turning to credit cards because they can't keep up with living costs. This is because the price of rent, you know, cost of rent has gone up significantly under Joe Biden. Grocery prices have gone up. Gas prices are up. The, just the basic staples to get by, you know, when you calculate after taxes, uh, after uh, groceries, you know, the median income in the United States with the median housing costs. And if you calculate a median grocery spend, all of this, there's essentially no money left. Mm -hmm. No money left. So if you have some emergency pop up. If something occurs, people are having to go to the credit cards to make up the difference. And and now that this much debt's been built up, you know, uh, a lot of Democrats, Joe Biden, are kind of almost pushing uh, Jay Powell, uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve, to cut interest rates. And last year, a lot of folks were banking on there's going to be a bunch of interest rate cuts. Um, yeah, because they want they want pressure on him to cut interest rates ahead of the election, make Democrats look better, try to bring down some of these costs. That's exactly right. And and that is not only not materialized, now it's looking like, uh, you know, because inflation is sticky. You know, last month's inflation numbers came in, again, hotter than expected. Mm -hmm. Numbers keep getting revised up. It seems to be a, sort of a pattern here. seems to be a bit of a pattern. <laughs> so, like, because of that, the Fed has not indicated that they are going to be doing cuts imminently. Like the hope was, uh, especially among the left and a lot of journals, that by June, we're going to have an interest rate cut. It's guaranteed, mark it down. And like now we've even seen the stock market is spooked because it's looking more and more likely. You know, we're not getting those rosy projections last year if there's going to be nine interest cuts, uh, interest rate cuts in 2024. Those keep going down, the number of interest rate cuts and when. Originally, it was like June is a lock. Now it's looking like it's not. So yeah. so all that credit card debt is going to remain at a high interest. We're talking like blood money interest rates of like 35% plus on credit cards right now, which is just breaking people trying to get by. Yeah, and then even beyond the credit cards, you're, I mean, it, it, it screws up the rest of the lending, whether it's you're trying to finance a car yep. or you're trying to buy a home. You know, I mean, it's it's really, really rough out there. It really is. And and the credit card debt that people are paying, it's not it's not dissimilar to the debt, the, the debt service costs that the country is paying on a routine basis. Michael, yeah. you talk about spaghetti, how spaghetti. Let's let's put up graphic number three. This is U.S. government expenditures this is back from uh, 2022. 
Yeah. So um, in there, we've got what? We've got Social Security, 19 percent of our government expenditures. Twenty two percent is Medicare, Medicaid. Um, so right there, you've got 41 percent of everything the government spends mm -hmm. is on entitlement programs and, and government health care. So that, it's, that, that those people invested into. It's either, okay, so we're going, so, we're so going back either, to the boomer conversation. It's, it's either debt service or boomer service. Well, that's not even the debt service. That's literally just the cost of running those, those, those programs. And then you've got you know defense in at 11 11 percent. Um, we've got uh, oh student loan programs 400 482 billion dollars. <laughs> and again, that is an underestimate because we mm -hmm. keep getting lawless. Uh, uh, student don't quote forgiveness, which is taxpayers are picking up the tab. So what yeah, we're so, looking so at is so important for people to take on two hundred thousand dollars in debt for gender studies degree. It, exactly, and then have taxpayers pay for it is you know, and and the message has gone out to a lot of younger folks by journos by the media saying that like don't even pay your student loans. Eventually, Biden's going to cancel them. So there is a crisis of the left has been spending like a drunken sailor, mm -hmm. and trying to give handouts to their voters, that's that's basically their method of trying to win elections, is they promise every group, we will take from your enemies and we will give to you. That's the, the Essentially, that's the promise of the left in a nutshell, whether it comes to uh, lawfare, whether it comes to the government spending, whether it comes to the student loan forgiveness. They're united by one thing of, we will punish and rob your enemies and we will give you all of it. Well, And, and, and just like we were saying earlier, when it comes to personal debt on living off the credit card. That's what our federal government is doing now. We've got huge, huge, uh, you know, costs for, for interest on this debt. Um, you know, interest on our, our debt at this point is going to exceed defense spending in mm -hmm. this country. So like our national debt, we've always said is like a national security issue. Now it absolutely is. Mm -hmm. And let's put up graphic number four here. You can see the U.S. interest payment scenarios for our debt. That's a terrifying. Terrifying. Image. It's absolutely terrifying. So you've got U.S. Treasury interest payments. You got the projection, uh, assuming rates are stable, and then a projection of a, a 150 bips uh, Fed cut. And all of those are just horrific. Yeah. Uh, and for the folks who are on YouTube, essentially imagine a graph that just, it's like a plane just pulling the stick up, going up. straight up. It just rockets, like it's almost vertical, the interest. Yeah, you're, yeah, it's you're, like it's like Elon Musk's Falcon Heavy. You're you're, ta you're talking a trillion dollars in interest mm -hmm. on our debt, and there's no conversation happening on the left of, you know, guys, maybe we should try balancing this budget. Let's try to figure out how we can uh, cut waste because the amount of wasteful spending that this government Joe Biden's been doing, but the, no, that's they, again, they don't they don't want to balance anything. They want to subsidize thing. gender studies programs at at colleges that people just don't even need to go to. Because so, they are grassroots. They want to fund using taxpayer money. So I got a larger question, though. Like, is anybody actually taking this seriously? Like, I know the Democrats don't actually care at all. But like, is anybody like right, left, center taking this seriously? Because I don't feel like anybody's taking this seriously. I think seriously. a number of Republicans are. I think it's a, a concern of a lot of Republicans, especially in the House, uh, that there's a lot of concern about the spending levels that's been happening in Washington. And I mean, recently, that that caused almost like a schism in the House over like, this is about spending. Well, that's yeah, I know. Stopped. But 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 that was on discretionary spending, which like, if you look at this is like a little blip on the radar compared to what our non-discretionary spending is that is just sort of guaranteed in our budget every single year. I mean, so this is kind of like an insidious angle that a lot of folks take what Duncan is trying to do, which is what am I doing? A lot of, what am I doing? A lot of leftists even try to mostly leftists try to do this where they're like, why don't we just start robbing from social security and medic? Like this, I'm not, their, their I'm, plan is I didn't like, say that. why don't we just, because you're like, oh, this is, we're looking at discretionary spending. So you start hearing it's these ha, like it's buzzwords, half our, folks, It's half it our means, budget. Why not just rob the senior citizens who built this country and paid their way up? <laughs> the answer is, folks, we're spending too much. We're spending too much. On it, what? It's not what that we, we what, don't what have we enough spend, money. What are we spending, spending too much on? We're spending way too much. What is it? On all these government programs. Oh, okay. Why? Why again? So Duncan has championed for the longest time the student loan forgiveness bullshit. <laughs> which is why should we have taxpayers have to pay for these people's college degrees when number one they hate us, 
And number two, if they couldn't find a job that can pay for a degree, they should figure that out before they sign the dotted line saying, will you take this loan? Because they agreed to take it on, they agreed to pay for it. So why why do they get to jump out of that Duncan? And and, and meanwhile, <laughs> the senior citizens who Duncan. have paid their way, you want you want to rip them off? It's unbelievable. Well, it's forty one percent of our budget and the boomers have been in charge of our politics since 1992, and we have trillions and trillions of debt to show for it. So when do they feel like they can help us dig out of that hole? But that's Never? the thing. That's the, that's the thing is I'm, I'm the not answer asking. is not we need to steal from somebody. That's like leftist thinking of like you cannot just, grow this pie. It's a smug, you know what I mean? Like smug. if you grow this economy large enough – the same way that we've had it grow in the past, the pie gets bigger. The thing is that like leftists are these kind of like zero sum game people who are like, they don't think about well maybe I could go get a job and I'll have more money. They think about maybe I could steal from somebody. Well, none of those people that are on Social Security are having a job. That's 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 not what we're because discussing they, at all. Because they already did. That's, that's the not, thing is the way that you're describing. We should rob it the sounds, boomers. It sounds it's like insanity. it sounds like you're creating a straw man argument. That's not the argument I'm making at all. I'm I saying merely, is I stand with the boomers. I stand with the senior yes, citizens who built clear. this country yes, who have paid their way. You've made it and very they don't clear. deserve a single cut. They paid their way to us being into trillions and trillions and trillions of debt. Yes, that is 100 percent correct. I would merely suggest, perhaps for my children and the following generations, that the boomers have said they want to leave this country too. That we pick a different way, a more sustainable way in which we don't rack up trillions and trillions of more of debt so much that we have more interest on our debt than our entire national defense of this country. It's indefensible. It's indefensible to suggest that, that we can just keep doing this forever and still have a functioning government. That's right. A hundred percent. Yeah. And we need to cut these entitlement programs that Democrats use to get elected. Okay. Wait, the wait. amount of money that they wait, spend. Wait, you just said you, we, should, we need to cut the entitlement, entitlement. You said that we need to protect the boomers, I'm saying but the, now you say we need to cut the I'm boomers. I'm saying the entitlement programs that Democrats use is what they use to get elected. Entitlement programs like student loan forgiveness. Their version of entitlement isn't you paid your way in, like Social yeah, but Security. N- nobody, That's nobody, the difference. Nobody's saying student amount, loan forgiveness. No. What you just said Duncan is Duncan said that he's for student loan forgiveness. No, I times never said, He just makes stuff up. Folks. What I'm saying is <laughs> we can spend all this handouts that the Democrats have been doing to their base that they feel entitled to. They're, they feel entitled to student, le- uh, student loan forgiveness. We can cut all of that spending, all this waste. You hear about these government or taxpayer-funded studies of like uh, – can we make two male frogs mate? You know, yeah. why are we paying for this shit? I don't think we should be paying for we that shit. We should pay shit. for any of that shit. But I, but I think in our politics, and like, look, we should cut that bullshit 100%. That's where it should come from. But like, I f- to suggest that Social Security should be cut is insanity. But, but like $1 million from the frog mating program, yeah. cut it, and then you still have the multi-trillion that's always been their dollar argument. problem it, Duncan's that's, talking that's about. That's always been their argument. There's a million of these roaches hiding under the fridge, and you're like, well, it's just a, each roach is small. No, stomp, stomp them all out, dude. Okay, cut, okay The fine. amount of cut, government waste— fine. Cut. It's mind boggling. Right. It, so, let's but, assume there are one million. It's a it's one like a million small dollar mindset that, programs. like, oh, you know, you, you, you okay, you, know. you still have a multi trillion dollar. Well, problem. let's let's let, let's put it in in terms that like an American family would have. Okay, like let's say I make four thousand dollars a month, and my mortgage is thirty five hundred dollars a month, and grocery bills, utilities, gas, car payment. You know, I'm at the set say thirty nine, thirty nine fifty a month. What you're suggesting is if I just cut off Netflix and stop buying Starbucks, I'd I I'd, nope. I'd have a good budget, family budget. No, because and the reality thing. is is like you maybe you might you, you might need to refinance that mortgage. You might you might need to be into a different house because you have every month costs that are fixed that are going to be on your balance sheet every single month. And see, month. that's the thing is that's a defeatist attitude to think that like, <laughs> oh, just you know, go make more money. You should exactly yeah. like this okay. country. We expand our economy when we have conservative policies. So well, this we, is we, true. Ex- we can expand, we can have growth, but it gets stifled when you have Democrats that invest only in their grassroots in the sense of we need voter turnout, time to forgive loans, time to use taxpayer money. It's like walk around money. Like, it's election day, it's time to hand out the cash. That's the way Democrats have been using our taxpayer dollars. Well, I, I, I understand that, and I understand that Republican but policies are better at But to suggest that, like, every, every American, all, it's look, time look, for you look, to make look, sacrifices look, 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 look. because all, all, our government spends too much? Hell no. Well, all, all I'm Not saying happening. is from uh, Reagan to George H.W. Bush to Bill Clinton, 
you know, to, to George W. Bush, to Barack Obama, to Donald Trump, to Joe Biden. The problem has gotten worse, and we haven't paid down our debt one single nickel. So I think his, history would prove me right and you wrong, but we can go ahead and just move on. That's wrong. We did have a balanced budget. We'll when the, be back when the right after it. this. Okay, you guys want to get to some variety? Always. We have great, variety. great, great variety here. Um, first of all, I don't know if you guys uh, watched it, uh, that um, there's a lot of great sports over the Easter weekend. There was mm -hmm. golf on, there was baseball, there was basketball, obviously March Madness um, and all of that. But there was also the UFL. This is the XFL, USFL, the merger. Oh, yeah, right. You know, I like spring ball. I love football, so I love having that on. And, uh, you know, watch the D.C. Defenders, mm -hmm. who unfortunately lost. Um, but I saw that they did actually pretty amazing numbers. Yeah, they did. They did actually great numbers. And they were up against March Madness, which they weren't last year. They were up against a, a women's March Madness, You're which right. has taken off, gang, you know, done gangbusters well, this I, year. Well, I, I saw that LSU-Iowa game did better numbers than, like, the NBA Finals. Yeah, yeah It did better did. numbers than, like, almost every college football game other than Ohio State-Michigan. Yeah, but, you know, the UFL was up against the NBA. They right. were also up against Major League Baseball, and they did better than both of those mm. leagues on Sunday. And they actually, one of the games did better than, than golf. And the reason why is because football is king. And I really think that That's, people yeah. are hungry for it. They want to watch guys hustle for something and not watch, like, LeBron walk down the court and right. then lecture everybody after the game. Like, they want competition. And that's why I think, you know, people who are who are pushing into football, spring football is really smart. Fox was really smart to, to really work to consolidate these two leagues and, and make it something special. Well, it's, it's something special, and it's also something that is um, helping the NFL evolve its product as well. I don't know if you saw this, but they had that owner's meeting for the NFL where they adopted the uh, what was at the time the XFL rule now it's right. UFL rule on kickoffs because kickoffs I don't know, you know it's you, the number one cause of injuries it is it is and and so the NFL had changed the rules uh, a few years ago um, that basically made it a ceremonial play that did nothing. It was mm. always touchbacks. Nobody ever returned the ball. You know, if, if you put the ball in the field of play, then you could call a fair catch and get the ball to 25-yard line. So it became a pointless play. Mm -hmm. But the XFL now, the UFL, had, has a different way of setting up that kickoff, right, where, like, the players don't take a running start, and, it, mm -hmm. you know, that ball gets kicked and they can't move until the player receives the kickoff yeah. and it makes it for like an exciting play again and it it's does. but it's not as dangerous for the players and i'll tell you american football for america and for the world at large has really become the sport everybody wants to watch you know soccer for europe and for the third world has like for a long time been something they okay. like to watch why are we attacking soccer but but in reality the real competition the real sport the real man's competition American football is like on a rocket ship, and I really think that spring football is going to become a bigger and bigger thing over the years. I love it, and uh, I love the DC Defenders. They lost this last weekend, but you know they got to the championship last mm -hmm. year. They're fun to watch. Anyway, but you know, you know something you mentioned just yeah. sort of in, in passing. This basketball game between Iowa and LSU was so fun to watch. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if you guys watched. It. I know I you watched, watched it. it Dunks. Yeah. I, I'm sure you caught some of it smug. I mean, like, there's a reason why 12 million people tuned in. It's because there was actual competition. They were actually passing. These girls were actually sprinting to the ball. Caitlin Clark was hustling to try to to try to win, and it's just something you do not see in the NBA. Well, yeah. You, what, you, what you saw is two teams that. You know, the the teams had an identity, and they were trying to set up an offense and play to their own strengths, and each team had sort of their own strengths. LSU, better team at rebounding. Um, they're a more physical team. Yeah, different, Obviously, different styles of ball. Yeah, Iowa, you and know, I Caitlin should say, Clark's great you, shooter. You used to see this in the NBA. And you don't see Jordan it anymore. And Dominique Wilkins. Like in the 90s, you, in the 80s and 90s, you saw this in the NBA. Yeah, but, but like, what, what the NBA had then in that game, LSU-Iowa had now— 
is storylines. Yeah. Right? Like fans that are, that are focused on the competition. Right, right. And fans like watching a sport with 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 storylines. And the NFL does a great job of this. And if you, you if you follow any of the off-season stuff in the NFL, they do a fantastic job of building those storylines that go into training camp and go into the preseason and mm-hmm. QB battles and all that sort of stuff. But that's a key component to storytelling. It's a key mm-hmm. component to getting people's attention. And you saw that in that Iowa and LSU game. They couldn't the last thing I'll say on that, LSU really bungled, uh, I think, the, the coach's decision to, to try to figure out who was going to guard Caitlin Clark. Mm-hmm. I mean, that Haley Van Leith is a, a good basketball player, don't get me wrong, but she could not cover Caitlin Clark. Maybe nobody could. I don't know. She was shooting lights out. It was like Steph Curry. But, but I mean, they ended up giving up, what, nine threes to her? Nine? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, almost a record, or yeah. maybe tied for a record. But you mentioned storylines, and there is no sport that understands storylines or has historically like boxing. Yeah, so I want to get to this, because we've previously mentioned here on the show, Smug, maybe you've taken a punch from Mike Tyson on TikTok if if, Jeff, Yass, yes. if, if Yass has the courage to do the right thing yeah. and call you. Um, but, you know, Mike Tyson's going to be in a fight here, upcoming against uh, YouTuber Jake Paul, you know? Um, Jake Paul's the favorite in the fight. He is. Well, you know, Vegas. Mike Tyson is, uh, what is he, 57 years old? Yeah. Yeah. So this from foxnews.com, Mike Tyson admits he's, quote, scared to death about Jake Paul fight, which I was a little surprised by uh, here from the article. Mike Tyson has accomplished just about everything a boxer could in the sport. His next opponent in Jake Paul has just 10 professional bouts. Tyson is in the conversation as the best boxer of all time. On the contrary, while Paul has his eyes set on becoming a world champion, he certainly has a long way to go. But the butterflies are alive and well, even for, quote, baddest man on the planet, who admits he is, quote, scared to death about his fight with the former YouTuber. Now, I mean, there's a couple of different ways you can read this, right? You can say, all right, Mike Tyson's trying to build up hype, for this contest, right? And, you know, I mean, that's part of boxing and boxing promoting. But what I read into all of this is that, like, Mike Tyson is your classic agony of defeat guy. That, like, the thought of possibly losing terrifies him. And that's what motivates him to succeed. So I think I, I think it's just uh, being honest on that level. I, I was seeing photos when the fight was first announced of Mike Tyson, like, a year ago, using a cane to get around, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. Although I've I've seen some of the videos also of him training now and it looks terrifying. Sure. Yeah. Um, he's a fifty-seven year old guy at the end of the day, you know, right. like father time is undefeated. Um and I, I a lot of this can be attributed to like Don King mismanaging his money that he's gotta come back and do fights like this um for a quick payout. And like I just you know, I hope they keep it as much of like an exhibition match. I mean, ideally, everyone would love to see Mike Tyson clock the shit out of this guy. Dude, there's no such thing as an exhibition with Mike Tyson. Did you see that fight he did with Roy Jones Jr.? No, I'm, I, I'm, I guarantee that there's no but, way but, he's hurting this kid. No, but Ro- because Ro- like this kid is signing his check. That's well, the thing. The, is that's how you know at the end of the day. Oh, you think you, you, his you think, competitor is signing his check? You think Tyson's going to pull a punch? Hundred percent, dude. He's, he's not going to kill this guy. By... I don't think Mike Tyson is capable of that, dude. We'll see it. You don't, I don't know. You don't. You think. You think Jake Paul is signing the check? Mike Tyson's not signing the check because because it really helps Jake Paul to fight Mike Tyson. Yeah, but too. Th- but look, Thriller. What I think it was called. It was Thriller. Was the promotional. Um, did did the rights to that that Roy Jones Jr. Uh, fight against okay. Mike Tyson? Okay, and I I thought Jake Paul was involved in that as well. I don't know if you remember that, but like Roy Jones Jr. came out like it was an exhibition and Mike Tyson just annihilated him, Mm -hmm. annihilated him. Well, I think Jake Paul is no joke. This this is a guy who everybody is like, oh, he's just on YouTube. Oh, he's just an influencer. He's he's actually like put his mind to this. He's actually training. He actually is. He's. I've There's seen, a reason why right. the Vegas odd make, odds makers have him as the favorite. Yeah, I mean, I, I've seen some of of those fights, and I I would say like he definitely has progressed as an actual actual boxer, and he's got a height advantage and a reach advantage on Mike Tyson, like no doubt, one hundred percent. But, but, he's fighting an actual boxer this mm-hmm. time. You know, I mean, some of the other guys that he boxed were like mixed martial arts guys, UFC guys, stuff like that, and he put some gloves on him and he has to 
you know, box him. Yeah. Now you're fighting an actual boxer. Right. He has the reach advantage, but does he know how to use it against Tyson, who has been fighting against guys with the reach advantage his entire career? His whole who career. knows how to get inside, knows how to. Yeah. I mean, if he actually hits Jake Paul square in the jaw, the guy could go down in one punch. Yeah. Um, okay. So I think we need to get to this ESPN story here. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw this on Twitter. Um, it was kind of shocking. Um, this is a uh, former ESPN host Sage Steele uh, revealed that her 2021 interview with President Biden was, quote, scripted by network executives. Oh. <laughs> In an interview with Fox News Digital, <laughs> Steele, Steele recalled the, quote, structured nature of the pre-taped interview so much that her ESPN bosses handed her a, quote, script to go off of. Quote, that was an interesting experience in its own right because it was so structured, Steele said. And I was told, you will say every word that we write out, you will not deviate from the script and go. Isn't that incredible? Yeah, but I mean, it, it, honestly, this just confirms what everyone knew. I mean, all of this is orchestrated in terms of whenever Joe Biden has an actual sit-down interview— the circumstances that they're willing to do it. This is why he doesn't do like uh, uh, press releases. Mm -hmm. And the one time that he did do it, he completely bungled it to the point that every American saw this guy is not all the way there. Yeah, this is how know, the media operates. Yeah, you know what the media does with Joe Biden is very similar to what doctors and pediatricians do with children. They point to a chart and say, "Do you see the face? Tell me where on that smiley face or frowny face describes your pain." And I feel like the media does the exact same thing with Joe Biden on a routine basis. They make it as simple as they possibly can so that they can keep that patient alive to beat Donald Trump and get a second term. But isn't it sort of fast? Like, I, I could understand this in a lot of mainstream news publications mm -hmm. where, you know, Biden grants them the interview and they have some control over the questions that are asked and that sort of thing. I would expect that from some of these, you know, broadcast news outfits or some of this stuff. But the idea that it, it happens at a place like ESPN as well is sort of crazy. Well, it's crazy until you remember what ESPN is. I mean, yeah. it is a liberal bastion. There, there, There is... Like ESPN is part of the reason why I think the NBA has fallen off and why a lot of these major yeah. pro sports have fallen off because they focus on the politics of sports, not the competition. You know, what yeah. pe what people people don't want politics in sports. That's why they turn it on so they can get rid of their stupid job or the stupid politics. They want something different. ESPN is a part of the problem. And I'll say this about Biden. Like, I understand your point about like, Hey, I'm going to give some questions, some suggest. I'm the press secretary for the White House. I'm right. going to give some suggested questions to the person who's interviewing me. Joe Biden has never sat down with like a major difficult interview in his entire presidency. He just he hasn't done it. Right. And like there's a difference between suggested questions and like someone who's pressing him on things he's incapable of answering. That hasn't happened since day one for this guy. And if it had, I mean, his his 38-point approval rating would probably be 25. Yeah. All right. So from the politics of sports to the sports of politics, we need to get into a update on Hack Madness Smug, the most important contest of the entire year. Yeah. So... As everyone, I'm sure our, our listeners know, Hack Madness is underway. This is the time of the year we hold these liberal hacks in the media accountable. And, I mean, voting has been underway. We finished the third round. Uh, we're down to eight teams, eight, eight folks here uh, competing for the title. And so far, I think the biggest upset, uh, folks, Jen Rubin lost. Hmm. Keith Olbermann beat Jen Rubin. 58.5 to 41.5. I mean, I'm shocked. Like, it's my shocking. bracket's been completely busted, but, like, I have absolutely no shot with Ruben already out, not making it to the Elite Eight. Absolutely stunning. More of, you know, the rest of uh, the contest, you had, you know, way bigger leads. Uh, Jen Saki beat Max Boot, just crushed him 82 yeah. to 17. Um, but that really shocked me. Is, is You see Jen Ruben 
losing. And this is a previous champion. Like, she was the champ before Taylor Lorenz. You had Stelter win it, then you had Ruben do back-to-back, then you had Taylor Lorenz. And then you watch Taylor Lorenz. I mean, she seems to be coasting. She beat Joy Reid 64-36. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is shocking to see a two-time champion fall like that, especially before the Final Four. And so uh, for the folks listening, by the time you hear this, Round four should be underway. The Elite Eight. Yeah. And the only way to vote, go to my profile on Twitter. I have it pinned at the top. Make sure you vote. We're, I think we've crossed half a million votes already cast. Wow. Mm. Get in there. Make your voice heard. Hold these hacks accountable. Um, I, I, I noticed that Horse Sense, uh, yeah. great, great minion, uh, who helps us with uh, Hack Madness. Dot org where where you you know could submit your bracket and all that sort of stuff. We have a little in, internal competition here amongst the four hosts on on brackets. Uh, Smash, you're actually in the lead. Well, I'm not surprised, Michael. Because yeah, because all these journals are your buddies. Yeah, yeah. I know who's going to put out the worst takes. <laughs> they send them to me on a routine basis every morning, and uh, and so because of that, I feel like I have an advantage. Uh, Holmes is in in second there. I'm one point behind him in third, and Smug. I think losing Jen Rubin really hurt you. Yeah, yeah. You're in I fourth. mean, like I said, that was to me that was a huge shocker. It upset. was a shocker. Keith Olbermann, though, you got to give him credit. The dude has been on overdrive, especially over the past month or two, of horrible takes mm-hmm. out of his mind. I mean, and and you see it. He's playing to win. Yeah. All right. So last thing I want us to do today, and we haven't done it in a while. We haven't done it in a while, and uh, I think the fans deserve it, and that is us going back to a tradition here at the Variety Program, and that is the five stars. And in the five stars, we have to go first to The Voice. Okay, Michael. Uh, This first one comes from Imprudent Warwick. Okay. And uh, the subject is bananas out of the hammock and into the pool. (laughs) (laughs) Imprudent Warwick writes... I stumbled across the announcement for this show just before its premiere and haven't missed an episode since. Nice. It's refreshing to get clear-eyed view of campaign operations and a day-to-day politics from guys with years of experience in the trenches. The difference between the insights offered on this show and the cacophony of voices from the green rooms and faculty lounges of the wider media world cannot be overstated. Man, this guy, I love this guy. He says... I love the way the hosts disagree with energy, but without anger, because sometimes I disagree with them too, but I always come away with something to think about. The games are hilarious, the interviews are top-notch, and they're never stopped. they've never never stopped improving the show. Hats off to the hosts and the production team for an excellent product with attention to every single detail, right down to the way they arrange their seating in order of testosterone level. I guess that means Ashbrook at the top. <laughs> Keep it up, boys. And let no turkey go unpunted, no monkey unpulled. Wow. Imprudent I, I Warwick. That. that is so good. I love that. What I like is the subject line, bananas out of the hammock and into the pool. Well, that's how you know it's a, it's a long-time <laughs> it's listener. It's a long-time listener. Yeah. Uh, Smug, what do you got for us? So this is coming from Comfortably Scott. The title is Comfortably Green, parentheses, Keeper. It says, thanks, fellas, for another great episode. Your guests are awesome, always informative, and entertaining. Mr. Capito hit it square in the screws and right down the fairway. I have not missed an episode. I originally heard about you from Dana Perino positively commenting on Comfortably Smug's wow. Twitter. Wow. Nice. Wow. Okay. Which you led to something. Ruthless. Ruthless introduced me to the MK podcast. Your show is very inspiring. I and others are engaged locally and also in D.C., part of the process and plan to protect our rights. National Golf Day in D.C. is May 9th. Mm. Keeping a golf course pristine is a lot of work and at times thankless. Your riff on green keeping was hilarious as I was performing some spring cleaning. The goal is, quote, if a pine cone falls, grab it for the second bounce. Wow. Mm-hmm. Thanks, green, uh, green Keeper Scott. Thank you for listening. Nice. It's, just, it's, such a great, uh, it's such a great review because you know these greens keepers. I mean, if you spend any time on a golf course and you see how green it is, you see how beautiful it is. You it's really a labor of love. Need, they you, know what they're it, doing. It is. You, you have to find the greens keepers after you're around and you got to thank them just say thank you i mean you, it, they work so hard especially this time of year as we're coming into spring now yeah and you know they're trying to repair the courses and get them in in good fighting condition for the onslaught of uh, later spring and summer 
And, you know, I've always wondered, I have to assume, like as a greenskeeper, it's sort of a Sisyphean task, right? Like you make it as perfect as possible and then people come in and they leave divots. Right. You know? Right. And they're chunking up your golf course and it's just like this beautiful piece of art that you've put together that you right. constantly have to go back and repair and repair and repair. It is art and not enough people express their appreciation of it. Do I? It's like it, they got Judge Schmales walking past him to his big Cadillac. <laughs> you know what I mean? There, there aren't Caddy people. Shack. Right. There aren't people saying, man, this is beautiful. Thank you for doing what you yeah. did. Yeah. So I got one more here. Um, the uh, submission here is I Love Games. Uh, the title is Funny and Funny and Informative, but dot, oh dot, dot. So I guess we'll, we'll see here. Nice. They write, uh, love you guys and look forward to every Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, to hear what you all have to say. I am very tired of boomers getting trashed and all lumped together. <laughs> this could be my mother or your mother. Yeah, probably both. Uh, we are not all the same. I've worked hard and long to get where I am. I'm sorry to younger generations, but nothing is free or owed to you. You will have to work hard and make sacrifices to achieve success. That's the truth. It is. It is the truth. That is the truth. I don't disagree with that at all. Perfect. I don't disagree with that at all. I, I would I shout would, out to all the boomers. Like I, Duncan tries to hold you down, but still no, you rise. Still, look, it's nothing. It's nothing personal. He just wants me, to rob me and the boomers. And um, oh, we should bring it up. Uh, so my mom, uh, my mom sent me a text after that episode where we had throwdown on the boomers, and I, I I sent you this where she said, "Hey, I'm I'm reworking my will. What is Smug's full legal name?" <laughs> so I could put them in it. And that's the thing is, I will always stand with the boomers. They are the greatest generation. They're the beating heart of this country, and they've earned everything that they're given. Do you know so my mother also texted yeah. on this exact same subject. I wasn't here for the show, but she texted anyway because she listens relentlessly. She said, please tell Duncan and Josh your mother would like to talk to them about boomers. Yeah. <laughs> well, they can go right ahead. But you know what my, <laughs> you know what my response uh, uh, to that text from my mom was, Smug? I sent her a picture of my son, and I said, Smug didn't give this to you. <laughs> that's the thing. At the end of the day, nothing will beat a grandchild. And that's exactly that's what they want. That's what they want. And, and, what you and, and I want every boomer in America to know that's the sacrifice we've made for you. So please don't mortgage my son's future for a cost of living adjustment. That's what I would really appreciate. <laughs> for a cost of living adjustment. Fellas, I think we did it. I think so. Absolute banger of an episode gentlemen thank you so much to the minions for listening for those five stars that were wonderful and don't forget vote in hack madness i should have it at the top of my profile so until next time minions keep the faith hold the line and own the libs we'll see you on tuesday stay ruthless